The following is a presentation of The Day. Live from the historic Guard Art Center in downtown New London, we welcome you to the 33rd District State Senate debate. Tonight's debate features Democrat State Senator Norm Needleman and his Republican challenger, Brendan Saunders. We now take you to the moderator for tonight's debate, the editorial page editor of the day newspaper, Paul Sean Year. Welcome to our live stream debate in the 33rd district race for state Senate. My name is Paul Charnier and I'm the opinion editor for the day newspaper. I am moderating tonight's debate and joined by fellow panelists, Lee Elsie, morning talk show host of 94.9 News Now and a contributing day columnist, and by day staff writer and editorial board member, Julia Bergman. Taking part in tonight's debate is the Democratic candidate, Senator Norm Needleman, and his Republican challenger, Brendan Saunders. This is the last in a series of four state Senate debates hosted by the Guard. There is no live audience. We only have enough people in attendance for production purposes. We're utilizing social distancing, and everyone is masked except those directly participating in tonight's debate. The 33rd districts consist of the towns of Chester, Clinton, Colchester, Deep River, East Haddam, East Hampton, Essex, Haddam, Lyme, Old Saybrook, Portland, and Westbrook. Under our debate format, the candidate responding to a question will have one minute to answer. The opponent will then get 90 seconds to respond and rebut and the candidate who originally took the question 30 seconds to sum up. Questions will alternate. We begin with one minute opening statements, starting with Senator Needleman. Senator. Good evening and thank you. Two years ago, I came to the state Senate with decades of experience in business and town government, promising to use it to build common sense solutions. I've done that and passed legislation with broad bipartisan support fighting every day to achieve tangible results for every individual and business in the district. I authored and led passage of landmark legislation regulating public utilities, putting Main Street ahead of Wall Street and ratepayers ahead of shareholders. I helped build the biggest rainy day fund in the state's history without raising sales or income tax rates. When the pandemic struck, I worked directly with the governor developing a template based on science and data for reopening the economy. My efforts reversed the administration's position on mandatory consolidation of school districts, and I voted to cap the cost of insulin. I promised to make my experience work for everyone in the district, and that's exactly what I've done. Thank you. Mr. Saunders, you have a minute? Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters today, uh, Paul, Julia, Lee and my opponent. Uh, I'm a, my name is Brendan Saunders. I'm a native of the 33rd District. I was born and raised in Westbrook, Connecticut. I have lived in Clinton for the past decade. For the past decade, Connecticut has been in a fog. Neighboring states recovered from the 2008 recession, but Connecticut did not. Uh, continued to lose job, continued to lose residents, uh, continued to see our real estate values fall. Hartford's response has been to raise taxes, to add more taxes, to disguise taxes as fees, and to create onerous regulations. Companies have fled, small businesses have suffered, and our wallets are empty. So a vote for me is a vote for one who will bring relief, who will fight for the cost of living, who will fight to create a stable business environment, and who will be a voice for all members of the district, not just my party. I thank the candidates for opening statements. With that, we'll begin our debate. Uh, the first question is from Julia Bergman, and it is to Senator Needleman. The state's response to the coronavirus pandemic has been dictated by Governor Ned Lamont through his emergency powers, which he has extended until February. Do you agree with this approach? And given the spike in COVID-19 cases in Connecticut, do you think it is wise for the state to stay in phase three of its reopening plan? So thank you for that question. And um, 
first of all, I just want to say that the governor has done a terrific job. Um, the committee that voted uh, to give him those executive powers back in uh, March uh, voted again. The first time it was completely bipartisan. This time it was not. It fell on partisan lines. Being an executive, um, owning a business and running a municipality, I understand that a lot of decisions cannot be made legislatively. Um, the legislature takes a very long time to do anything. It's the way it's built. It's structurally the way it is. Um, so I think that we are in a crisis. We're seeing a second wave. We obviously understand that this is not over. Anybody who's looking at the data sees that we are heading back into something significantly worse. Um, the only area that I think that I would like to see the legislature having more to do would be on the issue of the budget. But I don't think that we are equipped in the legislature to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of running the state. So I think that what we've done is fine. I think next year is going to be another story, and we'll see thank, where it goes thank you, come Senator. January. Uh, you have 90 seconds uh, to comment on the question. I believe that an abundance of caution is a good thing, but I think that extended rule by executive fiat is not. I believe that the legislators should have been in the room from the very beginning. Uh, they are the ones who are accountable to the residents. They are the ones who can tell you, this is going to work in this town, but it may not work in that town. And they have been left out of the room, by and large, and it should not be that way. I, I, I think it's interesting that my opponent talks about how long legislature takes to work, and yet in this time of COVID, they were speedy to pass uh, bills like the uh, police accountability bill and to run those things through. They certainly were able to get together and do that in a speedy manner. And so my point is that we can act fast when we need to act fast. I do believe that uh, my wife is, uh, is a nurse and that the nursing home decision was a, was a bad decision. It cost lives. And again, this is a case where if there had been more people in the room, maybe that decision wouldn't have been made. I also note that during this time of COVID, it is my opponent who used the system and worked the system to get $2.7 billion do uh, million dollars of PPP funding to give his, uh, his employees a raise. This was not to keep his doors open. This was not to, uh, uh, because of layoffs, this was simply because he was using the moment to get this. Um. Senator Needleman, you have another 30 seconds to respond on this uh, round sure. of questions. I'm, I'm not going to respond to the personal attack at this point, but I am going to say that um, I think the governor has done a terrific job. I know the legislature. I also know municipalities. It would have been impossible for the municipalities to make decisions at, um, without the governor's leadership, and it would have been impossible for the legislature to do what they would have had to have done to save lives. Ned Lamont has done a fabulous job. We have aided, we have been in the, in the room, we've been discussing it. I personally have regular conversations with his senior management. They listen, they're taking input, and I support what we've done, All right. regardless of the personal attacks. Uh, thank you. If, uh, and if our candidates uh, just be mindful of the timekeepers uh, helping out with the time element. Uh, the next uh, question uh, is from uh, Mr. Elsie, and it goes to Mr. Saunders. Mr. Saunders, uh, paid family leave would be the next topic. The program needed a $20 million bond just to get off the ground. Are you satisfied, A, that the program is solvent, and are you concerned about potential loopholes for fraud and abuse? Yeah, I think that uh, paid family uh, medical leave is a good thing. Keep in mind, we already had uh, family medical leave. Uh, the way that we have done it, the way that we have executed it, is a big question mark to me. I'm not sure, in fact, that it's solvent. Uh, what we've been sold is a bill of goods that it's only a half a percentage uh, payroll tax. But first of all, that's on all of us. So again, when we talk about the 2019 budget and the fact that there were additional taxes added into that, we do have to keep in mind that, that uh, not only that budget, but, but this act uh, added additional taxes uh, during the past uh, two years. Uh, the funding will run out because state employees and large companies can be excluded from this. And the 0.5% um, can actually range up to 5% uh, without legislators' input uh, because it's run by a board. Again, it's out of the hands of the legislators at that point. So, no, I have serious concerns uh, about that. Thank you. Senator Needleman? Sure, thank you. Um, so I absolutely support paid family and medical leave. There is no paid family and medical leave. 
um, at the present time. There is no fund. The $20 million that your question refers to is what it's going to take to get the system set up. There's a gap between when money is going to be collected and when the first payments would be made. Um, I think that we live in a society where so many people live on the edge, where so many people are struggling um, to make ends meet, make decisions between childcare, taking care of a parent. This is not for high income people. This is for people who live at the minimum wage or just above the minimum wage. I think it's a great program. I think it's gonna benefit people. Um, and, and I absolutely believe that this is something that we should do. The people are calling for it. We reacted the right way. And I think that it's gonna be a very good program for the people that need it. Uh, Mr. Saunders, you got another 30 seconds. Uh to complete this exchange? Yeah, let's say that again. $25 million just to get the ball rolling. 10 million of that is just for the software to implement. And this doesn't account for the fact that they want to hire 300 more state employees to actually run this program. So it's going to be far more than $25 million over the years. Now, the Republicans offered a plan which was summarily dismissed. That was a voluntary participation. As a rider on your disability insurance plan, you could choose when you wanted your time off, how much you wanted, and you could deduct it from your paycheck. That is a good option to me. Um, uh, I'm just going to give 30 more seconds to the center just because he, he raised the point, uh, why not the Republican alternative to have a voluntary program rather than a mandatory program? So a voluntary program, the numbers definitely wouldn't add up. If It's like unemployment compensation. If you don't have everybody paying into it, it's clearly not going to work. It just wouldn't have enough critical mass. It, it's just not a practical way to do it. And look, I, I'm happy that the state would invest millions of dollars in software. They have not invested any money in the unemployment compensation software for 40 years. And look at what the hell happened with that. So I think it's going to take time to get this up and running. I think people in this state need it, people in this state want it, and there is absolutely no voluntary program that right. would work. Thank you. Uh, next question is to you, Senator Needleman. Uh, you'll have a minute. Um, uh, as Energy Committee Chairman, you took the lead on the bill passed during the special session that creates performance-based rate making for power companies and opens power companies to paying damages to customers for extended outages. Uh, but will any of this change the state's status as the most expensive for electricity uh, in the continental United States? So thank you for that question. Um, we've had a long 20-year walk into the woods of the nightmare of how we make electricity rates in the state of Connecticut. Um, and there's no magic button to say we're going to fix it tomorrow. Performance-based standards will not only work to empower Pura to give more, to give them more authority to hold the utilities accountable. But I'm quite happy to uh, know the new chairperson up here. She's very different. She is a professional regulator, and we have not had that in the state. So my co-chair and I and my ranking member, Senator Fromica and Representative Ferraro, were unanimous in believing that we should do this and we should do it now. The bill is a great bill. It is going to turn the corner of a battleship that has been going in the wrong direction for a long time. And I think it's a great plan for the state of Connecticut going forward. And I'm proud of it. Uh, Mr. Saunders, you have 90 seconds. Your, your comments on our energy situation here in Connecticut. Uh, the answer to your question is no. Uh, this new bill will not lower rates at all. Now, it may bring accountability, which is a good thing. It may help with customer service. That's a good thing. We may see better outcomes, which is all a good thing but there's nothing in it that's actually going to lower the rates. In fact, it's an incentive-based program. What's the incentive? The incentive is that they'll be able to charge higher rates. If they're going to meet the standards that are, that are asked of them, they're going to have to add staffing. They're going to have to add labor costs. They're going to have to do uh, whatever level of infrastructure upgrades that they can, and all this is going to cost, and all those costs are going to be passed on to us, the consumer. So no, it isn't going to, and it isn't going to because of my opponent's recklessly aggressive pursuit of renewable energy, which he himself admitted on Lee Elsie's show, comes at a high cost. He's passed an act concerning a green economy. He has passed the windmill bill, and both of those are bills that are going to continue to have rates raising in the years to come. It was actually on the fiscal note of HB 5002, the, uh, the act concerning a green economy, that this is going to raise rates for the payers. The windmill bill, as I said, is going 
going to raise rates for the payers because in the end, it is going to require Eversource and United Illuminating to purchase energy from these windmills uh, at a rate that is almost double what they are currently paying. So the answer is no. Uh, Senator, you have another 30 seconds? On sure, this thank you. So uh, I just want to be clear about what I heard here. I heard that my opponent doesn't believe in climate change. I heard that my opponent doesn't believe we should be doing anything about it. And even the most radical right-wing members of the Connecticut General Assembly do not agree with him. We are doing something that is going to create a, a better future for the state, for the country, for the world. We're setting an example. I support it. It was bipartisan. The wind energy bill, the procurement authority, is a bid. It will lower the cost over time. And absolutely, it was unanimous in the Senate. Thank unanimous. You. Thank you. I would like to reply I'll to give the you uh, 30, 30 seconds. Thank uh, you. Well I Mr. will Saunders. reply to his personal attacks. Uh, I, as a man of faith, faith which he has attacked, uh, I actually do believe that we are called to protect our environment. I believe that we should be seeking renewable energy sources. What I don't believe in is a recklessly aggressive pursuit with man-made mandates. There's no reason why we have to get here by a certain time. There's no reason why by 2025 or 2030 we have to reach these. The only reason we have to is because his party has determined that we need to get there at that point. I am all for low carb, no carb options, and one day getting us to that 100% renew renewable energy, Thank you. which, by the way, isn't viable now, as California shows us. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is from uh, Ms. Bergman, and it's to Mr. Saunders. Mr. Saunders, earlier you mentioned that uh, decisions by Governor Lamont cost lives in uh, Connecticut's nursing homes during the pandemic. Can you elaborate on that? And Senator Needleman, when it becomes your turn, um, more than 3,000 nursing home residents died from the during the pandemic, uh, accounting for about 70% of the state's death total. How would you rate the Lamont administration's handling of nursing homes during the pandemic? And you have a minute to open this uh, debate. Well, I think that you, that you put it best. You just put the numbers out there. The fact of the matter is, uh, um, <laughs> right now it's as though blame is trying to be put all around, whether it's, oh, we were just following the CDC or, or we were just doing this, whatever. The fact of the matter is it was a bad decision uh, to send folks to the nursing homes. It was bad for uh, those uh, who were suffering. It was bad for those who were patients in the nursing homes. It was bad for those who were attendants and staffs and workers in the nursing homes. So it was not a good decision. Regardless of who you want to pin the blame on, and, and if you want to rule by executive fiat, then you should probably be the person to stand up and say, the buck stops here, So if you want, if you want to do that. So uh, no, it was, a, it was a bad decision, and it cost lives, and you just proved it with the, with the numbers that you shared. We still have the high, one of the highest death tolls of COVID in the, in the country. Senator Needleman, you have 90 seconds. Sure. I love it when people take shots from the, from the sidelines here. All I will say is we in the Northeast were in the first wave because we are a hub um, we have a major airport where people were coming in. Not enough was known about this virus. We did not know that there were asymptomatic carriers. Nursing homes clearly don't operate or had not operated at a standard anywhere in the country to do high level infection control. There was not enough PPE. We, we were hit hard. We stopped the wave. We stopped it before it got all the way across the state as we learned more. I'm proud of the work that the state has done. We have one of the lowest infection rates even now. Um, every loss of life is tragic. Every loss of life is tragic. And I've had to deal with people who lost family members. This has been a catastrophic thing. I'm not going to point fingers and blame people, except maybe in one direction for mismanaging it incorrectly. But in the end, I'm proud of the work that Governor Lamont did, and I'm proud of the work that we've done in this state. The health directors, the frontline workers have done a yeoman's job with no tools at their disposal at the time. And we stopped what was coming our way. Um, and, and we know now, and Connecticut's uh, residents are the most educated around, and they have been wearing masks and doing the right thing, and we've kept the caseload very low, and I'm proud of Thank that. You Thank can you. take shots, but I'm proud. Mr. Saunders, you get another 30 seconds on this one. Yeah, every loss of life is tragic. That's exactly why it's tragic that nobody will stand up and take responsibility for this. People have died, 
and nobody will take responsibility for this. We've paid out-of-state uh, consulting firms to help us through this. We've put together blue ribbon panels to, to study this, but still in the end, nobody will stand up and take responsibility for this. Those who lost uh, their grandparents and their parents deserve to have somebody step up and take responsibility for this. All right, thank you. Uh, the uh, next question uh, goes to Senator Needleman, and it's from uh, Lee Elsie. Senator, the majority of law enforcement personnel feel the elimination of qualified immunity puts them in a very difficult position to do their job. If you could specifically, what aspects of this bill do you like, and specifically, what aspects do you not like? So first of all, the first version of the bill, which everybody seems to keep referring to, had actually removed qualified immunity from police officers. The second version, and I was one of the senators that pressed to get the second version done, uh, restored qualified immunity. It added some accountability to the towns, but the police officers have qualified immunity. I want to say that really clearly. Police officers had and still have qualified immunity. It was the hardest decision of my public life to vote on that. I am a chief of police. I work closely with police officers every single day that I'm in town hall. Very painful decision because I'm dealing on the one hand with the police officers who I respect and love and work with, and at the same time with a community that's been in pain and feeling over-policed. If you want to go to the details of what we could do differently, because I think other things have come to light, like the use of force policy and the uh, consent searches, I think we're going to have to revisit some of those things I'm gonna, when we go back. We're going to have to have you save that for your next uh, response. We, we have a little more time with this exchange. you get 90 seconds, Mr. Saunders, on the... Uh, Please accountability bill discussion. I'm proud that I have stood with the good men and women of law enforcement, unlike my opponent. I'm proud that the Connecticut State Police Union chose to endorse me, an endorsement that they don't give very often, but they recognize the importance of standing with the men and women. As a black man, I understand the importance of the issue. As a black man, I have been profiled. As a black man, I have faced uh, uh, discrimination, and I can tell you that nobody hates a bad cop more than a good police. So this bill was supposed to be about giving the tools and resources to the good police to be able to root out the bad police, and we failed miserably by handcuffing everyone. And we did it in a horrible, horrible manner by pushing this legislation through. As I said earlier, we moved awfully quickly to get this legislation put through without the proper public uh, um, uh, uh, time to, to review it, without the proper committee uh, meetings necessary. We, we did this to do this. And as a black person, I'm insulted that you think so little of me, that you think it's okay to just throw anything out there, and I'm going to be happy that you've done something. I grew up and was taught by my father that anything worth doing is worth doing right. So take the time, do it right, get things right. Thank you. Senator Needleman, you got another 30 seconds? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that, actually. Uh, I believe that as my Republican colleagues who were here said, 95% um, of that bill was fine. I think in a moment they realized that there was political opportunity, even though the qualified immunity got fixed. Um, I actually think that we came up with a good bill that was 95% where it needed to be. We fixed other parts. It became political at the last minute. I wish it had not. But I do believe that where we ended up with training and so many other policies that are in there, standardization, we're in a better place than we were, even though there are a couple of things that we're going to need to tweak next All right. year. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Saunders, next question to you. Uh, we've been raising the issues, but I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you consider the top two issues that you think will be most important to the people of the 33rd District, and what would be your position on those two issues? Oh, number one is the cost of living. Number two is the horrible business environment that we have here in this state. I remember when Connecticut was this beautiful hamlet between New York City and Boston. Uh, it was this place full of sleepy towns where you could come and you could live in a cozy neighborhood. And, uh, and the great thing was that there was great school systems and there was a low cost of living. It is no longer that way. 
And I judge that by talking to the people in the district. I judge that by looking in my own wallet. I don't judge that because some New York City transplants are coming our way. It's a good thing that they're coming our way. I would hope that we're cheaper than, uh, than uh, 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 New York City. But I judge that by, by my wallet and by listening to people and listening to the small business people who say, Brendan, I am being taxed, I am being feed, uh, and I can't keep this up. They are forcing my labor costs so high. And so, again, a budget that doesn't include additional taxes or raise taxes, I'm talking about practical user taxes, not simply the income tax, is, is a good start. Thank you. Uh, uh, your two positions you think are most important uh, issues for your uh, <clears throat> constituents. Well, I, I would say number one is figuring out how we're going to get out of the mess we're in because Eastern Connecticut um, even, even towns on my side of the river in Essex, but this whole district has been severely impacted by this um, virus, this pandemic. Um, we have the highest unemployment rate. We need to do the most work. I work closely with Commissioner Lehman and with the governor to try to figure out a plan. I support the casinos in trying to expand their operation. Um, so I think that that's number one. We have to get people their jobs back. I want to take issue with how horrible the state is from my opponent. I moved, I started a business here. I've been in business since 1979. I love Connecticut. I love Connecticut. Always things that you can improve. I'm not going to own the ills of 30 years in the past. I, got, I ran for office because this is a place where my family is, my sons, my grandchildren. I want to make this place better. But I love it. The quality of life here is unequal to anywhere else. People come here, people move here because they love it. It's not the cheapest state in the country to live in. I'm never going to say it is. But that's because Connecticut does things to help people. We, we have fabulous small towns and cities that need a tremendous amount of work. We're fortunate to live where we live, but the cities need improvement, and I'm committed to making sure that not only my district, but the entire state stays desirable. Thank you. Uh, 30, 30 more seconds on this exchange. I know that from your gated home, life is good. Yes, it is. Now, for the rest of us who are middle class, who are working hard each day, and again, I don't discount, you are the American dream. You built it. You ought to be able to enjoy it. But for the rest of us who are still working, the rest of us who may never get there, it's tough and it's rough, and, and your choices in Hartford have only done more to take money out of our pockets. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, do you have a question for Senator Needleman, uh, Ms. Bergman, here next up? Yeah, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, Connecticut was facing an affordable housing crisis. The pandemic has made the problem worse. How would you tackle the issue of affordable housing in Connecticut? So first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very proud of the efforts in the town of Essex. I'm stepping on my microphone. Um, uh, very proud of the efforts in the town of Essex. We've added affordable housing since I've been first selectman. I believe that everybody should have the opportunity to live anywhere they want. So much so that I asked to move one of my committee assignments from vice chairman of banking to vice chairman of planning and development because I do know something about how towns run. I don't believe that we need to run roughshod over zoning and planning regulations, but I know we need to make housing available to everybody. That said, just moving pieces on the trust board is not the answer to the problem of the concentration of poverty in the cities. We need to have jobs. We need to have transportation. We need to make sure that housing is available and accessible. So I think that we have a lot of work to do. I think that we have to be very careful. Those of us that live in these wonderful little towns um, have to be careful about how we move ahead, but we have to improve the opportunity for housing for other people. Thank you. You have 90 seconds on this issue of providing affordable housing, uh, Mr. Saunders. Yes, affordable housing is needed and necessary, but it should not be mandated by the state. State forced zoning laws and state mandated zoning laws is not the way to go. I do uh, applaud my uh, opponent that publicly he has been saying the same thing, uh, probably because he runs a town. It's one of his three jobs. He runs a town and he understands that many of our small towns 
uh, just don't have the infrastructure to support the demands that an influx like this would take, the sewers and the water, making sure that there's access to this for everybody. So one size does not fit all. The state shouldn't be pushing this. Communities should have the freedom to apply uh, standards and to work on this within themselves. Uh, municipalities should be encouraged to work together on this. Uh, unfortunately, even right now, because the state doesn't have its financial house in order, it isn't going to be able to help municipalities anytime soon. But maybe if I get into Hartford and we start uh, getting this thing going right, maybe then the state would even be in a position where it could assist municipalities in making that transition and making affordable housing available. And uh, Senator Needleman, you have another 30 seconds? Yeah, so th the state of Connecticut continues to fund affordable housing um, through, through um, several programs. And um, a, a most recent development in Essex is taking a, a commercial uh, project that was done in 1988 that has never been successful, moving the commercial downstairs and moving residential, all affordable upstairs, done with a local nonprofit that has obtained uh, $3.5 million from the state of Connecticut. They fundraised for local money. Hope Partnerships, one of my favorite organizations. I support them. I think they do a great job. And I absolutely think that the state needs to do this. Dan Malloy has a bad name for a lot of things, but one of his great legacies is his focus on affordable housing. Uh, with that, we'll move to uh, another question, uh, and it's from uh, Mr. Elsie to uh, Mr. Saunders. Moving forward, our budget may dictate we search for additional revenues. I assume that after the first of the year, conversations will turn to tolls once again, and if we're gonna fund the Connecticut Highway projects, would you be in favor of tolls? And if not, again, can you be specific on how you would like to raise money for infrastructure projects? Sure, thank you. There is only one candidate on this stage who will make a promise to the people of Connecticut that I will not vote for tolls in any form. There is another candidate on this stage who has publicly walked the fence while behind the back in committee actually voting for tolls. And that is my opponent. My opponent actually voted for tolls in committee, but of course publicly said, ah, oh, we'll have to wait and see. I don't think that tolls are a good uh, option. Uh, they are, as we say, a revenue grab. Uh, but there's a lack of, there's, the, the, there's an issue of trust here. Uh, I remember when this state had tolls on it, and then we took it away and we got one of the highest gas taxes in the country, but they said, all these funds are gonna go to transportation. Well, here we are 20, 30 years later, and they're saying, oh, we don't have those, it never went to, never went to transportation. So uh, why would we trust that these folks will keep their promise and actually have the money go to transportation? So I'm going to let Senator. go of the shot that um, about voting something out of committee because I don't expect that my opponent really understands how the legislature works. A lot of things go out of committee to be debated in the full uh, legislature. But let me just say for the record, um, we had tolls. There was a fatal accident on I-95. They were removed. The gas tax was high. Under the rel administration, the gas tax was lowered put us in a pickle that we're in right now. The special transportation fund's gonna run out of money soon. Um, fixing our infrastructure is a critical need for the state of Connecticut. A 21st century transportation infrastructure is what we need. We can't just patch and fix what we have. We have a 1950s era transportation infrastructure. All the bills that were talked about, all the proposals for tolls, there was no more harebrained idea than draining the rainy day fund by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, many of whom are close friends of mine. They were gonna strip out money and then borrow the rest from the federal government. That was a political statement, not a plan, as are so many of the things that come out because we have a two-party system where one party is in charge and the other one is not. I have to say that on my committee, I have not done that. I work hand in hand with my Republican colleagues to get bipartisan results, but transportation needs to be fixed. We have to come up with a plan. I will support something that works. I will not make it a burden on poor people in the state of Connecticut. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Saunders, you have another 30 seconds. I don't know that I heard how you would pay I, for it. Yes, I I'll get there. I heard I, how you're not going to pay for it. I acknowledge, to, as my opponent says, that I don't know the inner workings of Hartford. Uh, hopefully I will uh, next January. Uh, I don't understand <clears throat> playing the political game because I haven't been playing around in politics for the past 15, 20 years as my opponent has. But I do think that uh, we do need to think in terms of increasing revenue by growing our economy. That's the number one economic way. Economics 101 teaches you that if you grow your economy, you'll grow revenue. And we are seeing more revenue coming in, by the way, uh, by those who are relocating from New York City. So why not take that revenue that's coming in and uh, make sure that we allocate it wisely? And maybe that's what we need to be thinking about is in terms of reallocating funds. All right. Thank you. And I'm going to give another 30 seconds to Senator because I try to pin down Mr. Saunders where the money would come from. Kind of pin you down where you stand on tolls. Maybe not. Maybe not. Well, you know, so I didn't hear quite your position on tolls in another session. So I was not happy with either plan that was proposed last year, which is why I walked the fence. And many people, uh, including the Motor Transport Association, gave me credit for killing tolls last year. I'm not sure I deserved that specific honor. I did get their Legislator of the Year award. Um, look, the right plan. Every state around us has tolls. It's got to be a last resort. We need to be judicious about what we do. We need to exempt low-income people, add to the earned income tax credit, and not make this a burden if we do it. But I'm open to any solution that works. My Thank colleagues you. in the other party had Thank no you. solution, and my opponent has no Thank solution. You. Thank you. Um, next question uh, is to you, Mr. Uh, Senator Needleman. Um, so for the first time this election, because of the pandemic, the state is using widespread early voting by way of absentee ballots. Um, normally, Connecticut has among the most restrictive voting rules, with voting restricted only to election day and absentee ballots allowed only for very specific purposes, sickness, military service, of being out of state, religious reasons. Would you favor or oppose loosening voting laws to allow early voting, mailing voting, or, or other uh, reforms to make voting earlier? We start with you, Senator. So I think it took a, excuse me, a pandemic to react to something that has been an obsolete law in the state of Connecticut's, in the state of Connecticut's constitution. I absolutely support a constitutional amendment to making voting accessible, easier, earlier. However we do it, we need to be on the same page on this. So many other states have done it. Every, you know, I have a town clerk that works for me and registrars of voters that work for the town. I support their efforts to try to do this this time because we're in a pandemic, but we should not be here. We should have fixed this a long time ago. I absolutely will move forward and propose legislation to move for early voting and mail-in voting going forward. What's your position on that, Mr. Saunders? Well, I, di I didn't like the plans, but I voted for them. I'm going to have to have you teach me that uh, before I go to Hartford. Uh, I do think that when it comes to uh, absentee early voting, if you have a truly secure system, then, then yes, uh, early voting uh, uh, is, is a viable option. Uh, we certainly understand now with the health safety that we need to have uh, uh, absentee ballots, but my problem is that we, we, aren't, we aren't sure of the security of our current system. Uh, I know that the Republicans tried to add an amendment uh, that would have been uh, would have secured the ballot boxes more securely. It would have uh, had more stringent rules on where they could be located, but that was shot down by the Democrats. So what we have is a come one, come all system put in place by the Secretary of State, codified by the governor, and rubber stamped by the legislation in special session where we can get stuff done quick when we need to. Almost 80% of Connecticut voter fraud Con, uh, convictions involve fraudulent use of absentee ballots. That's a Heritage Foundation study. If we're going to do it, we need to do it right. And that's the theme here. I'm tired of hearing Hartford politicians say, ah, no bill is perfect. No, nothing. No, if it's worth doing, then it's worth doing right. And it's high time that we put people in Hartford who are willing to do it right. By way of note, the state of Colorado has a very secure early voting system, but it took them several years to build it. And we want to throw this together on a whim. Senator Needleman. I'm going to again forego the personal attacks that I've been getting here with every response that my opponent has made. What I will say is we're in a pandemic. 
We needed to do something. We did the right thing. I think that we're going to have a free and fair election in the state that many people need to vote by absentee will be able to vote. I'm not concerned about fraud in this election. Um, I think any plan to do a constitutional amendment takes years to do, and I support that long term. In this situation, I support what we did because people were afraid to vote. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bergman, do you have a question for Mr. Saunders? And you'll have a minute. With the development of a vaccine for COVID-19 underway, it's likely there will be debate in the General Assembly to remove the religious exemption for students, which is the most widely used exemption by parents who do not want to vaccinate their children. Would you support the removal of the religious exemption and why or why not? I would not. My wife is a nurse. Our daughter is vaccinated. But I believe that it is a very personal decision that each parent needs to make as to whether or not they want to follow suit and have their children vaccinated. And I believe that they deserve the freedom to make that decision on their own. Uh, medical experts have testified, uh, this was when that bill was trying to be uh, moved through, medical experts testified that making edicts and, and banning uh, uh, that kind of thing is in the, in the long run, in the short and long run, is far less effective than simply increasing education on the topic. So let's increase education on the topic. Let's be glad that we have herd immunity. And I do not believe that we should be stripping the freedoms of decision making from parents away from them. Senator Needleman, you have up to 90 seconds on this. Thank you. This is the religious exemption form. You're attesting to the fact that you have a religious belief, not a personal belief, but a religious belief that your child should be exempted. There are two exemptions in the state of Connecticut. One is a medical exemption, which doctors will not give on a whim because vaccines protect the other kids in school. You can do what you want with your children. My grandchildren are vaccinated. My children were vaccinated. I was vaccinated. When I was young, I took live polio vaccine because my neighbor had polio and I saw the ravages of that communicable disease. Putting kids in school, nobody's making you do anything. They're saying if your kids want to be in school, they should be vaccinated because it doesn't, it's not your choice, it's the choice of every other parent, every other child in the school. I support people's choice to not vaccinate their kids, but I also support the school's rights to say you cannot have your kid in the school. And to be quite clear, there are virtually no religions out there, organized religions, that say that vaccinations are bad. Virtually none. It's individuals, it's a very weird mix of people, it's from extreme left to extreme right, to Orthodox Jews, to, to I don't even know, it, it, it's based on bad information out there, and unfortunately, it's going to hurt if kids. You wrap up, thank you. Another 30 seconds to respond to what you've heard, Mr. Saunders. Sure, he's absolutely correct that uh, getting a medical exemption is, is extremely hard, and that's why uh, people are defaulting to uh, their religious uh, faith. Um, I am not one to question someone's faith. Uh, my opponent has talked about my personal shots at him, and yet he fired the biggest personal shot of them all at my faith. So I'm not going to question somebody's faith. Again, we have herd immunity, and we do, I think it's interesting, we give choice, we've given choice as far as the, uh, the, back, uh, the COVID has gone as to whether parents have wanted to send their kids to school or not, but we can't give them a choice about the vaccine. And I do agree, the schools do have the right to say the children can't come if they're not vaccinated. All the religious exemption is. Uh, can't send your kid to school. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give Mr. Saunders 30 seconds and then 30 seconds for, for Senator Needle to respond. You, you've, I think you've a couple of times ra raised the, uh, the allegation that your religion, religion has been attacked um, uh, by a senator. Uh, could you elaborate what we're talking about and give the senator a chance to respond? Certainly. Well, the senator knows. He, he doesn't need for me to elaborate. He's the one who commissioned three rounds of mailers calling me a, uh, uh, an anti-gay activist. So he certainly knows uh, what, what he has put out there. He certainly knows that he owes me an apology. He certainly knows that he owes uh, the, all the people of faith in the district an apology uh, for uh, his anti-Christian uh, attack ads against me.
Senator Needleman, uh, can you respond? Yeah. So my opponent would not talk about where he stands on a woman's right to choose, on gay rights, on any of the other critical, critical civil rights issues. Personally, he said that gay rights being equated to civil rights are a, it's a sinful lifestyle choice to be gay and it shouldn't be equated with civil rights. I'm sorry, that is out of touch. The mailers pointed that out and I'm glad that my opponent has clarified his position because that's actually what he believes. It's a sin. I don't think so. Thank and you. I will fight but to protect people's rights. But that's not what he rights. said in the mailers. I'll Thank you I'll give you, you another 30 seconds. Uh, that's not what he said in the mailer. What he said in the mailer is that I'm an anti-gay uh, uh, activist. And that is not at all true. Uh, as I pointed out, and, and you know what, it, I, don't, I don't have to, have to uh, go through. I pointed out, I, we put the record out there with, with WTNH, and when he says that I wouldn't answer the question, nobody was asking the question until he started his attack ads. He started his attack ad. He decided that he knew what my views were on abortion. He knew what my views were on, on homosexuality, and so he could attack me and say things that were, in fact, inaccurate, because he didn't say anything about sin in, in his attack mail. Or again, he, he simply labeled me as something that I am not. Uh, and so uh, I think that he needs to really think about uh, how he has coached this whole thing. Because nobody was asking the question. All Otherwise, right. I would have been happy to answer it. All right. Um, hot issue for you guys. Let's uh, move on to another question, though. Uh, it's to Senator Needleman, and it's from Lee Elsie. Uh, I've heard all week long on the stage that $15 is not an adequate minimum. Well, it's not an adequate living wage, I'm sorry, and it's not enough to support a family. If I made the decision, yours and yours alone, considering the ripple effects of a minimum wage, and you're a businessman, you know what the ripple effects are of a minimum wage, Chris, where would you set the minimum wage at? Well, I actually went back when the whole conversation about the minimum wage came up, and I looked at the minimum wage when I entered the workforce in like 1812. Um, <laughs> and it was uh, if adjusted for inflation. It would be right around where it is right now. But I got to ask one question. I have a lot of close colleagues on the other side of the aisle, but they never argue about what the right amount is. They want to relitigate the idea of a minimum wage. I spent a lot of political capital and a lot of energy to extend out the time to get to $15 an hour within my caucus. Not one Republican voted to, to raise the minimum wage. I support a minimum wage. I support making it a decent wage, not a totally livable wage, because too many people in this state and in this country live on the minimum wage. They live on benefits from the state of Connecticut. They live on benefits from the federal government. So we needed to be adjusting this Thank continually. Thank you. Now we have to catch up. Thank you. Uh, you got 90 seconds to uh, express your views on the minimum wage and the increases that have been legislated. Sure, the, 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 the issue with the minimum wage is that a minimum wage, uh, no matter what level you set it at, doesn't actually result in a living wage. It never has and it was never intended to. Uh, what happens where, as you raise the minimum wage is that businesses cut hours, they cut shifts, uh, they cut uh, uh, people, and they go to automation. If you walk into McDonald's and you see the kiosk, that's the result of rising minimum wage. When you go to stop and shop and that stinking robot comes around beeping at you and all that, that's, mm -hmm. that's the result of the minimum wage. So uh, in Seattle, when they first raised the minimum wage, I believe it was to $15 at that time, they actually saw a decrease in jobs available, and it actually drove a, man for, a demand for high-skilled workers. So in other words, it hurt the people that it was supposed to uh, help. Do we need a minimum wage? Sure we do. Uh, I think that we also need to understand that it hurts small businesses the most. When I talked with restaurant owners uh, in, in my opponent's hometown of Essex, they told me, Brendan, this is killing us. We hire teenagers. And they're, they're no, they're, they're, there's no skill, right? And then, then we teach them how to do what it is we're doing, and then they leave, right? And we have this labor cost that keeps going up because the minimum wage keeps going up. 
So I believe that we should at least build in exemptions for small businesses under 50 or under 100 that when they're hiring unskilled labor or uh, youth under the age of 21, that they can have an exemption in that area. Another 30 seconds uh, to respond, Senator. He didn't actually say what it should be. There is an exemption for a training wage. It's 85% of the minimum wage for people who work for three months or less because quite unfortunately, a lot of young people support their families. They put money in, in the kitty so that their families can get by. Look, there's no magic number here. I employ 270 people as of today. And we pay from minimum wage or above it all the way up to high salaries. There's got to be a floor. It's got to be a fair floor. If Too many people up, live at the bottom. Thank you. Uh, next question is, begins with you, Mr. Saunders. Um, the, the current uh, Trump administration has been very aggressive in enforcement of immigration law. Uh, Connecticut, on the other hand, and particularly many of its cities, have taken a different approach uh, and, and do not want to cooperate with federal authorities in identifying and prosecuting cases against individuals who are here in violation of immigration law. Uh, undocumented residents, for instance, can obtain a driver's license. Do you agree with the state's approach, or would you seek to change it? And please explain. I, I, I believe that uh, the, the, the approach that the president has taken uh, is the proper approach in that he's abiding by the law. If you don't like the law, change the law. But as the law stands, what the president has done, it, my understanding of it, is that he has uh, simply enforced laws that have been on the books through Barack Obama, through George Bush, that weren't being enforced. So we're simply enforcing rules that are on the books. And as I said, if we don't like those rules, if we don't like those laws, if we think that they're harsh or they're wrong, instead of just uh, deciding by caveat that ah, as a city we're not going to abide by this, then that's something that should be taken care of on the national level to change our immigration policy. Uh, Senator, you have 90 seconds uh, to respond to the issue and your views on how the state uh, handles this issue of immigration. So I, I need to put that in a frame of reference that my opponent says he supports the president's approach to immigration. Um, locking up kids, putting them in cages, uh, building a freaking wall, I'm sorry. N none of this makes sense to even the people who support um, restrictions on immigration. He wants to stop legal immigration. He wants to stop illegal immigration. He doesn't want to have a guest worker program. I think that the president has been extreme. It's a campaign promise, and it's inhumane. State of Connecticut and other states in this country have taken a different approach. We need guest workers. We need people to come into this country like my grandparents to earn their way up, to fill the gaps that other people, for jobs other people don't want to do. Um, and President Trump, in this particular area, as well as several others, has demonstrated a total lack of humanity here, a total and absolute lack of humanity. People have been held in churches my, my, my good friend over here is a minister. They have been given sanctuary because they are ripped away from their families. DACA kids are running around terrified. We have people here that came when they were two years old and they have no protection other than the protection that Barack Obama gave them. These are in the courts now. I agree we should change the laws, but it's the Republicans in Congress that do not want to change those laws. Thank you. It's not a Connecticut issue. Mr. Saunders, you get an another issue. 30 seconds. He is right. It is not a Connecticut issue. And I don't think that he understands that uh, under the Barack Obama administration, children were locked up and children were separated from their parents. In fact, one of the most famous pictures of this that uh, made its way around the internet and was blamed on Trump. This is what President Trump is doing in separating children from their families had in fact happened during the Barack Obama administration. So let's not point our righteous finger and say it's just this party that's messing this thing up. This thing has been a problem for many years, and we do. This is where we need true bipartisanship to, to come to a conclusion on what is the best way to approach this. I think the candidates on that one. Uh, 
Uh, Julia, do you have a question for Senator Needleman? <coughs> We've heard from several readers about an increase in divisiveness in politics, some of which we've seen in this campaign. What would be your, what do you see as the solution to bring civil discourse back to politics? And if reelected, how would you reach across the aisle in Hartford to get work done? Well, thank you for that, because every day I'm in Hartford, that's exactly what I do. Um, you can ask Senator Formica, who happens to be a friend, but is the ranking member on my committee, I have relationships with people on both sides of the aisle. On the Energy Committee, which is the committee that I chair, every bill that we passed was passed with broad bipartisan support. You live by example. There's a difference between politics and public service. I don't like politics. I consider my job, the work that I do at the town level and the work that I do in the Senate, public service. I'm 69 years old. I love what I do. I do it to help people. And the only way to really get things done is to do it by working with everybody. No monopoly on good ideas out there. Good ideas come from everybody, and we need to listen. And that's exactly what I've done. Every budget I passed in town for the last six years has been unanimously approved. Every Democrat, every Republican has done it. Same thing Thank with you. the bills I've done in the legislature. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Saunders, uh, how do we address the high divisiveness we're seeing in our politics? My opponent says that he's bipartisan. He voted with his party 416 times out of 418 times. He was absent for one because of a personal issue, and uh, he recused himself from another. So a 99.5% voting record with your party is not my definition of bipartisan. But we know that. We know that for the Democrats, the definition of bipartisan is, hey, we got some of them to vote for this. And so that's what my opponent traffics in. How, how do we take the divisive, the divisiveness out of this? Well, we don't make personal attacks on people. We don't get to the point where we're so desperate to win an election that we're willing to distort the personal and faith views of my opponent in order to fear monger, in order to work up my base. Uh, we just don't do that. That, what kind of person does that? A person with half the character of my opponent would, would have already apologized for this instead of trying to make ridiculous excuses about it. You want to take the divisiveness out of, the, out, of, out, of, out of this? Well, you would have to take my opponent out of this because he's been the one who's been divisive uh, uh, for the past uh, three, four weeks. I have pointed out his record. I don't know what more I'm supposed to do other than to point out his record. But he has chosen to go beyond that. That's divisive. That keeps it going. Senator Needleman? I'm going to just talk about how precious that statement is. It's not a secret that I'm Jewish. The digital ads that were run against me showed a bucket of money with a pair of handcuffs across them. I'm not sure how you feel about that, but that made me pretty squirrely, Brendan. So I, I faced this in my last campaign and in this campaign, and Democrats are routinely called snowflakes. Democrats have to take it when you dish it, but when, you, when we dish it back, you don't like it. You need it to be on the record for things that I think are critical because you're going to have to vote on them. It's not your personal right. opinion that I care about. It's how are you going to vote in the General Assembly? Uh, I know I'm, you don't care I'm about. I'm going to give you another thirty opinion. seconds because we have I, another thirty seconds. Just because he. To respond. I know you don't care about my personal opinion. You wouldn't. You wouldn't have. You wouldn't have done these attacks. Now, I also did not realize that a bucket of of money was an anti-Semitic uh, um, uh, statement in there. What I do know is calling somebody an anti-gay activist is certainly a a pretty uh, harsh statement uh, that is not true. And you know, so you just go from there. All right. Do um, I get a little bit of time to respond to that, Paul? Uh, we can let it go. I, we're going to have final statements. I, you know, I think we've had an exchange on that, and, and we, we're trying to keep this to an hour. So we're going to move to uh, closing statements. Uh, each candidate gets uh, one minute. And first up is Mr. Saunders. And you'll have a minute, and the clock will start when you're ready. All right. Well, I believe that in two weeks on November 3rd, uh, Residents of the 33rd District have an opportunity to say enough is enough. This particular election is specifically a referendum on the status quo in Hartford. 
it is specifically a referendum on this senator, a senator that has taken money out of your pocket with the legislation that he has passed, a senator who says he's bipartisan but has voted with his uh, party 99.5% of the time, a senator who took uh, taxpayer funding uh, um, in, that other small businesses needed in order to uh, give his employees a raise, uh, a, a senator who did not stand with the good men and women of law enforcement. If you want your voice in Hartford heard, you can trust that I will be the voice of everyone. Regardless of personal views, I understand that public service is about representing everybody in the district, not just my party and not just the people who agree with me. Thank you, Mr. Saunders. And last word from Senator Needleman. You have a minute, Senator. Thank you. Thank you all for hosting tonight. I'm proud of the results I achieved during my first term in the State Senate. Bipartisan results on major issues don't happen by wishful thinking. They happen when you bring credibility and experience to the table, when both sides of the aisle recognize and respect your knowledge and experience, when positions you take are clear based on science, data, and common sense, when you focus on outcomes, not political slogans or talking points. My impact in the State Senate is directly related to my credibility. It comes with me every time I walk into the Senate, and it is the foundation for which for the results I've achieved. Results are what you should demand from your state senator. Ask yourself which candidate has the credentials, credibility, and track record to get things done. I am that candidate, and I ask for your vote to reelect me to the state senate. With that, I thank uh, Mr. Saunders. I thank uh, Senator Needleman. Uh, that concludes our debate. We thank you for watching. Uh, we again thank the Guard for hosting this event and the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut for providing our timers. And on a personal note, uh, I want to thank all those working behind the scenes who have made these uh, debates a te technical success. And I uh, wish you all a good night and make sure you vote.